Hello and welcome. My name is Keith Barker and in this video, you and I get to take a look at the concepts of network address translation or as his friends call it, NAT. And for this discussion, let's imagine we have a cloud that represents a really big network, maybe the internet. And for our demo, let's go and use 23.1.2.0 with a 24-bit mask. Who's ever IP address space that really is? Thank you very much for letting us use it here as a demo for a moment. And then what would the internet be without at least one internet server? So we'll go ahead and label this internet server. And let's also imagine we have a company that wants to connect to the internet. So we'll put a little router here at the edge of their network boundary. So let's call that router one. And as far as networks go for router one, let's imagine we have an internal network here and another network here. And for IP addressing, let's go ahead and use, uh, for this network, let's use 10.1.0.0 with a 24-bit mask, and up here let's use 10.2.0.0 with a 24-bit mask. And just to make it easy, on router one, we'll just use dot one on each of those interfaces for each of those respective subnets, including the 23.1.2 network. And for our internet server, let's use dot 100. And for our server that's on this network here, let's go ahead and call this our server. And we'll give it the IP address of dot 100 here on the 10.2.0 network. And to make this complete, we're going to need also some kind of a device down here that we can test with on the 10.1.0 network. And we'll give that the IP address of .50. So its IP address will be 10.1.0.50. And the server and this client will be using R1 as their default gateway. And from a routing perspective, router 1 would have directly connected networks in its routing table for 10.1.0, 10.2.0, and also 23.1.2.0. On the public internet, we'd also have a default route that points towards the internet, towards the next top router for full access to the whole internet. However, for the lab, we're just going to use this little network segment 2312 to represent connectivity over the internet. So let's get into it. Let's talk about network address translation. And the idea about translation is change. We are changing something. And we're not just changing anything. We're changing IP addresses. Literally inside the packets as it goes through address translation, we're going to swap out either the source address or the destination address as it goes through. And that's important because if this PC right here wanted to go out to the internet, and let's imagine the initial flow looks like this. So the traffic is going like this. When the client's trying to go to that server, the source address on this PC is 10.1.0.50. However, on the public internet, that IP address is not a reachable address. So if the packet was even allowed to get to the server, which very likely it wouldn't because of its source address being 10.1.0, the internet server wouldn't have a route back to forward it back through the internet to get to this client because it's a private RFC 1918 address space. So what we do is we implement network address translation here in this example on router one. So the original packet before it goes through the router would be sourced from 10.1.0.50 and the destination address would be 23.1.2.100. That's pre-NAT and then post-NAT after it goes through router one and goes towards that server, the source address would be something that's new. That's what we're changing. And the destination address would be 23.1.2.100. Why is that? Because the client really is going to that server. All we're going to do is we're going to swap out the original source address with a new routable address on the internet that this company has been associated with. So we can't just make up somebody else's IP address. We'd have to use something that, based on the internet routing tables, would be forwarded back to this device. And that leads me to our first discussion regarding changing IP addresses. On the initial flow of traffic, what are we changing? Are we changing the source address? in the IP packets, or are we changing the destination address in that initial packet flow? So if we look here, the original packet was sourced from 10.1.0.50, and as it goes through NAT, we're swapping out the source address on that initial flow. And so this is an example of source address translation. And even though it's source NAT, where we're swapping out the source address on that initial flow of traffic, when the server responds back to whatever that new address is, the router that did the original translation is going to untranslate. So regarding the replies, the replies would come back to that translated address, and then the router that did the initial translation would untranslate the packet and forward it back natively to the client. So the client doesn't even know. It thinks, oh, I went from 10.1.0.50 to this destination address. The response came back to me, and that's because the router, in this case, doing the address translation, was doing the initial swap out of the source address and then untranslating it for the response. So most of the time, when we have customers on our private networks that are going out, we are going to be doing source address translation, because on their initial flow of traffic, we need to swap out the source address. So you might ask, well, Keith, what's an example of when we'd ever use destination NAT? And here's an example of that. Let's imagine we have a device out here on the internet, like a user at a computer. And that user wants to reach our server here at 10.2.0.100, except 
we aren't advertising that in DNS. What we're doing is we're advertising some reachable address, such as 23.1.2. Let's go ahead and use 200 because we already have 100 in use over here at this server. So if we've set up this mapping out to the outside world of 23.1.2.200, and this user on their initial flow of traffic is trying to go to that IP address, when this NAT device sees the destination of 23.1.2.200, it's going to swap out that destination address on that initial flow of traffic with the actual IP address of the 10.2.0100 where our server is. And so on that initial flow of traffic, we're swapping out the destination address, and that would be referred to as destination NAT. Again, on the initial flow. So here we have our initial flow where we're doing source NAT, and here on the initial flow, we're doing destination NAT. So now that we've taken a look at the concepts behind source or destination, most of the time when we're working with users on our internal networks going out, indeed we are using source address translation. So I'd like to focus the rest of our discussion and also the lab that we're gonna demonstrate on implementing source address translation. So I'm gonna go ahead and clean up anything related to destination NAT. And with that as our new focus now for just source address translation, such as this example, let's also talk about our options regarding source address translation. And that would include the decision, are we going to do a one-to-one -one mapping? For example, one client on the inside here gets a unique IP address on the outside as it goes through the address translation. And then client two, we get a different IP address. Client three, we get a different IP address. So that's an example of a one-to-one -one mapping with address translation. Or in most environments, what we're gonna do is a many-to-one mapping. And many to one mapping simply means this. We could take two or three or four or 500 devices on the inside here, and we could all map them over to one single address. So let's imagine we have 100 clients on the inside that are all going to the internet, and we would map them all to a single IP address. And that concept of many to one leverages a technique called PAT, port address translation. Because that's part of, it's not the only way, but it's part of the method that this router keeps track of all those sessions by analyzing and looking at the port information and tracking those as well. So even though 100 devices have gone out to the internet, when all those responses come back in, this router is keeping track of all the ports and the addresses involved and can correctly untranslate the responses and forward them back to the correct clients. So I'm going to go ahead and put a line here. And when we talk about one-to-one, -one, that is traditionally just called network address translation with a one-to-one -one mapping. And when we have many-to-one mappings, it's often referred to as port address translation or PAT. Now, out there in the wild, please don't expect everybody to use the right term for exactly what they're doing. So somebody could say, oh, we're doing network address translation, when they could really mean they're actually using PAT or port redirection or some subset of address translation. So now that we've identified what source address translation means, we've also identified NAT versus PAT with one-to-one -one or many-to-one. The last concept before we get into the demo I'd like to share with you is the idea of how to implement this. <laughs> and there's two basic ideas regarding implementing our address translation. One is to just hard code it, where we simply specify, hey, this translation exists, for example, from this device out to this specific IP address on the public internet. And whether the client's using it or not, that translation is going to exist in the configuration of this NAT device, this device doing the address translation. And when I say this NAT device, that's a general term for, it could be doing NAT or PAT based on how we implement it. So one option is hard coding it. And if we hard code it, that's referred to as a static network address translation mapping. So static means we're putting in the translation, whether the devices need it or not, that translation is going to exist in the mind of this router. Now, the other option is what I'd like to call if I have to. And you might say, what do you mean, Keith, if I have to? Well, the router, if we're using this option here, simply is willing. It has the rules in place where it can create the translations, but it's not going to do it. It's not actually going to make the translations and keep track of those unless there's customers that actually send traffic through the firewall. So we can kind of think of the if I have to mode as being dynamic. It's dynamically, based on a set of rules, dynamically going to create the actual translations when those clients show up and try to use the network. And that's referred to as dynamic. So if we are going to implement source address translation and we are going to use PAT specifically with many to one and we are going to do it dynamically, it would go something like this. On router one, we could create an access control list that identifies any traffic that's being sourced from 10.1.0. And then we include that in an address translation rule. that says if traffic matches that source, then go ahead and swap out the source address with an IP address I have in a pool or the IP address I currently am using on this interface. And whether we're swapping out that source address for the single IP address on an interface or a single address that's in a pool, that would be an implementation 
of port address translation, where we're doing that many to one. So here's something I think that'd be super fun and useful for you to do to reinforce this. Let's create a brand new lab inside of Packet Tracer. If you currently don't have Packet Tracer, if you go to netacad.com, sign up for a free account, you can download Packet Tracer for free. It's a great simulator. And what we'll do is we'll simply create router one. We'll have a server out here. We'll have a PC on the inside. We'll set up the IP addressing. And then with that little topology in place in Packet Tracer, we can configure and verify network address translation right here on R1. All right, so let's create that topology. We'll go down to routers. Let's bring out a 2911. I'll go ahead and call that R1. Let's bring out a client. So we'll click on the end devices. Let's bring up a laptop, put it over here on the left. I'll go ahead and call that PC. Let's also bring up a server on the right. I'll call that internet server. Let's put in some connectivity. I'll click on the connections tool. I'll go ahead and let it figure out the connections for us with the right cables. And we'll repeat that again from R1 over to the server. I'll move that over to the left here and let's configure R1. So we'll go to the command line interface. So here in R1, we'll go into privilege mode. We'll go into configuration mode. We'll name the router. And let me go ahead and take a peek at the interfaces. I'm gonna to go to options and preferences. I'm gonna say, please always show port labels. So I'm gonna see what they are and close that. Great, great, great. So we'll go to interface gig 00 first. We'll do a no shutdown. Give it the IP address we talked about. Go over to interface gig 0 slash one. Give it the IP address we talked about. Also bring it up with the no shutdown command. And then on the server, let's go ahead and configure the server with the IP address we discussed. So on the server, we'll click on config, go to fast ethernet zero. So for its IPv4 address, we're gonna use 23.1.2.100 and we'll tab down for the mask, which is gonna be three octets on for the mask bits. And then we'll give it a default gateway pointing to dot one so it can actually respond back to the PC. So we'll go to settings and for the default gateway is 23.1.2.1. That looks great. And then we'll just verify real quick. We can ping from the server to the router interface. So we'll do a ping to 23.1.2.1, and that is working. Great, great, great. Let's go configure the PC. So here at the PC, we'll click on config for interface zero. Let's give it the IP address of 10.1.0.50 with three octets in the mask on. And for its default gateway, we'll go to settings. And for its default gateway, it's 10.1.0.1. That looks good. And then we'll go ahead and test it by clicking on desktop, going to a command prompt, and let's do a quick ping to 23.1.2. Dot 100. And that's just going to verify our whole path. So that's the PC going out to the internet server. Now, in reality, the internet server, if it got an IP address from 10 anything, it wouldn't be able to respond because it's going over the internet. So let's go back to the internet server and go to the config and global settings. And I'm going to remove the default gateway. And that way there's not a default gateway here and it won't be able to respond back to this private IP address space. So we'll go ahead and close that. Let's go back to the PC. Let's try the ping one more time. And this time the server can't respond because it has no clue how to reach the 10 anything address space. All right, so back on the router, if we want to set up address translation, let's first set up an access control list that we'll use as part of our address translation rules. So we'll create access list one, a standard access list that says we're going to match on 10.1.0.0. And we only care about matching on the first three octets, just like that. So this access list is not going to be used for filtering. It's going to be used for matching source traffic that's coming from 10.1.0 anything. And then we're simply going to include that inside of a network address translation rule that says if traffic shows up and it matches this access control list, let's go ahead and swap out the source IP address. So to do that, it's IP, NAT, inside, source, list, and we want to point to list one we just created. And if we see that traffic, we want to swap out the source address with the IP address that's currently on interface gig zero slash one. And if there's more than just one client, we want to support everybody who wants to use that translation. So the overload is allowing effectively port address translation for multiple clients who can all be mapped to that same IP address. So in our rule here, it says IP net inside, uh, but how does the router know which interface is inside, which interface is outside? We need to tell it. So we're going to go into interface configuration mode for gig 00, and we'll say IP net inside, and then we'll go to interface gig 0 slash 1, that's facing the internet, we'll say IP net outside, so to get information about address translation, we can do a show IP net statistics and press enter. And this is showing us our inside interface is gig 00. The outside interface is gig 01. And on some flavors of iOS, it'll also show the actual access list that's being matched. We can also do a show run, pipe include, nat, and that will show us just the lines of our config that have the character NAT in it. So there's our rule. But if you take a look at the translation, show IP net translations, I press enter, there's no translations yet because this is dynamic net. We have the rule in place, but the PC hasn't tried to send any traffic yet. So if we go to the PC, 
and we'll go ahead and we'll do a ping. That works. And let's do something a little more interesting than just an ICMP. Let's go ahead and go to a web browser, which is going to be using TCP behind the scenes. And let's go to 23.1.2.100, our server. There it is. But now if we go back to our router, and now we say, please show us the IPNet translations. Now we have translations in place. We have some for the pings that happened a few moments ago, and we have one for the TCP session that we just established. And as far as these terms, inside global, inside local, outside local, outside global, there's a really great video that I have on my YouTube channel that goes over in detail exactly what each one of those means and why it means that. So I'd have you check out that video for greater detail on interpreting the output of show IPNet translations. So thanks for joining me in this overview regarding address translation with a demonstration of implementing dynamic address translation leveraging port address translation, or PAT. I'll see you in the next live event soon. Until then, be well, be happy, and keep on studying. Bye for now. You're putting in